Amen. Well, we're going to need it for this one. Amen. No. Revelation chapter 2. <laughs> amen. Uh, once we get past the churches, amen, then we'll really pick up our pace on going through the book because this is the foundation uh, for the book. Amen. And so we're going to begin tonight to look at uh, what the Spirit of God has to say to the seven churches. Often it's called the message to the seven churches. And I guess when I began to read and I've read and I've read and I've read and I've looked at different um, authors and some of the things that they've had to say and listen to others, um, question is, why those seven churches? You know, these are what we call the seven churches in Asia Minor, which is present-day Turkey. And, um, but uh, most theologians of the man said there was at least 100 churches, if not more during that time. And, you know, because we know that there was a church at Jerusalem where James, the Lord's brother, uh, was the pastor. Amen. They were first called Christians at Antioch. That was a church, wasn't it? But it's not called one of these seven churches. Then Paul wrote an entire book to the church at Rome, didn't he? A Gentile church where God was doing a great work at Lystra, Iconium. And none of those churches are mentioned here, but these seven churches. And... Um, Many believe that these seven churches are chosen as representative churches, and there's a dual stream of thought there. These churches did exist, and um, so they were actual churches that these letters were written to. But most believe, and I do too, that they were representative of the church throughout the ages, and that some aspect of each church we can find in every church. And there are warnings for us then and now concerning what we should allow in these churches. So they all existed. Um, there's also, once again, what we call that heptatic structure, even with the churches. Uh, there are seven commendations that Jesus made to the seven churches. And those apply to us as well. And there are certain things that he says in each one of those uh, concerning those having the ears to hear. That's for every church. And the letters are written to that church, but then he says, let him that had ear to hear what the Spirit said to the churches. That's our personal application. So even though we're not of those churches, we're still in the church. Amen? And so the applications for us even today. There are also what we call seven design elements in these particular letters. Um, each one, Jesus starts by naming the church to the church at Ephesus, to the church at per, per, <laughs> Laodicea, for example. And then Jesus has a title for himself in each letter. And then there's a commendation. And I love the way Jesus did that. And I'm going to compliment you on what you're doing good. Nevertheless, there's an exhortation to get something right. Amen? A couple of churches, he only didn't tell that they were doing anything wrong. He told them to hold fast. And so each church has a different line of instruction concerning them. Um, also, there are promises to each, to every overcomer. Amen. So that's in each and every letter. And a command to every person that listens. Let him that hath an ear to hear, we got to listen to what the church, what he, he's speaking to the church. Tonight, we're going to begin with the church at Ephesus. And that's going to be uh, basically the first uh, seven verses here. And it's going to follow that general outline. So it's not only is the entire book outlined in three sections, these letters are outlined in seven pointers, as it were, that he's pointing out to us that we need to take heed to. Let's begin to read aloud with verse 1. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write, These things said he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Notice the seven again. We see this all throughout. Verse 2, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou, thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say thou are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have someone against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, repent, keep reading, mm -hmm. 
move thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. I had two pages stick together, and I kind of got lost on that. But um, So we notice, like we said earlier, he begins with, uh, the title of the church, the name of the church that he's writing to. The angel, we know, is um, the pastor, the overseer in that particular church. Notice what it says. These things said he that holdeth the seven stars. Now, if you go back to verse 20 in chapter 1, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So he's writing to the leader in the church and to the church, and seven means what? Completion. And so Jesus, we see here, is holding the seven stars in his right hand, but he's walking in the midst of them. You know, only God can do that. <laughs> Amen. But thank God we're safe in him if we'll stay in him. Amen. So he holds and walks among us while holding us. Now, the word Ephesus here means the desired one. And it's primarily the lampstand bearer, just like you and I are. Amen. We're not the light. We bear witness to the light. Jesus is the light, isn't he? Amen? And so we're not the source. Jesus is the light of the world. He begins with uh, this statement, verse 2. I know thy works. So we know that God knows all, doesn't he? The Lord does. And he says, and thy labors and thy patience. So he knows this is part of the condemnation, I mean, the commendation, the compliment, as it were, that Jesus has given to them. And he says, I know your works and thy labor. So they work and thy patience. Thank God, amen. We need that, don't we? But then he said that they could not bear those that are evil. They did not tolerate evil. But I have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars. Now that kind of goes in front. Now I'm, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but. We're going to link this to the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing he said he hated. So we'll come back to that in a minute. He said that this particular church at Ephesus, the desired ones, would not put up with evil. Second, they would try those that say they are apostles, and they're not. Now, how do you try someone who takes a title and to, to find out that they're not what they hold themselves out to be? You'll know them by their fruits. But that's also judging, isn't it? Because you have to make a uh, determination whether they are. They said they're an apostle. And we have a lot of people that hold, that give themselves the title apostle in the body of Christ. But it says you're to try them. Um, Paul talked about the signs of an apostle. The apostle is one of the fivefold ministry gifts. But if they're true apostles, then naturally they're going to be false apostles. Or we could say wheat and tares if we wanted to, couldn't we? Wherever there's a real, the enemy is going to try and bring forth a counterfeit. So simply because someone bears a title, you know, that doesn't mean that we simply take them at their word. Because a lot of people, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really being pulled ahead there, slow down. They tried them and found them to be liars, okay? We'll cover that when we get to the Nicolaitans. But what he's commending them for also is what the Apostle Paul warned the church in Ephesus concerned. Now, if you go to Acts chapter 20, you'll find that Paul, in Ephesus, is warning the church in Ephesus about what Jesus is talking about right here. And this was a huge concern of the Apostle Paul, that after he left, what would happen to the church, that grievous wolves would enter in, not sparing the flock. Remember, it was at Ephesus where Paul got shouted down for two hours, you know, where he um, began to do damage to the 
stock and trade in Ephesus, which was selling those little idols of the goddess Diana. And they shouted it down for two hours. Paul meets with the Ephesians elders in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Verse 17, it says, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Now, note what he says in light of what Jesus just said. And when they had come to him, he said unto him, you know, from the first day I came into Asia, the letters are to the churches in Asia, aren't they? After what manner I've seen you with all, at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of man and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the land and weight of Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Verse 22, he says, And then, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing what the things that shall befall me there, saving that the Holy Ghost witnesses it in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions are bad me. But none of these things move me, me neither count I my life, uh, my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all, um, whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. And it's a sad time, but in this sad time, he's giving them a warning. Wherefore, I take you to a record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. And then he warns them, take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock. Now, this church Jesus is commending at Ephesus took that seriously. And so that's part of what Jesus is complimenting them about. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock of God, all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves, also of your own selves, also of your own selves, men shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He spent three years warning them concerning uh, some of those things, amen. And verse 32, he says, look, I'm commending you to God and to the word of his grace that will keep you. Amen. But he has a concern then. And oftentimes we can hear this concern in his voice, we see it with the Apostle John as well. What happens when I'm gone? And so Jesus, going back to Revelation chapter 2, says, look, I know your work. I know your labor. I know your patience. And you don't put up with evil. That's good, isn't it? And you've tried them that say they're apostles. You can see the link with Acts chapter 20. Amen. That warning they took very seriously about grievous wolves coming in and men arising from among them. See, the greatest enemies of the church aren't outside the church. They come from within the church. When someone rises up in the church and gets prominence, and then they begin to apostatize or deconstruct, as so many are doing now, and, and going out, famous, um, uh, some preachers, a lot of musicians are saying, I'm no longer a Christian. See, that makes them a danger because their position gave them influence. You're to try them. You're to look at their life, how they walking. And so he's warning them, this church has done this. And there are some that say they are apostles, that they have a, and in our, um, in the church too often today, we've taken these ministry gifts and we've set them up on a pedestal. So if someone says they're an apostle, you can't judge them because they've told you, touch not man anointed. Mm. So they set themselves up to be in a position where they can exercise what the Nicolaitans, it's actually the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that he said, I hate. Y'all ready to find out what that is? Well, he still commended them first, verse 3, because they judged them and found they were lying. Verse 3, he says, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and have not fainted. So this is a faithful church. They take the work of ministry seriously. And so Jesus is really coming. He's really, you know, y'all are doing a great job here. You're doing this. You're judging those that are false. You're not following them. You're not being led into error. And it sounds like, wow, they're really on top of it. Well, they are. Amen. 
and they're rooting out heresy. They're doing all those great things. They're obeying what Paul said, um, and Jesus knows that because nothing is hidden with him. But then he addresses his concerns in verse 5. Verse 4, nevertheless, nevertheless, this is what you need to work on to this church at Ephesus. Now, remember, that church needs to work on that, but it's a representative church. We need to be on guard for this. He said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Left your first love? Man, we're, 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 we're trying those that say they're apostles and are not. We're, we're walking in patience. We're doing what you told us to do. In other words, they got more works focused than they were devoted to Jesus alone. See, if we substitute busyness, and that's a trap for us all, like Martha and Mary, you know, you know, one said it, the Lord speak, didn't it? The other was busy doing what seemed to be the most necessary thing. Jesus said the most necessary thing is to sit at his feet. He said you, he's talking about priority here. You left your first love. And that terminology literally means you've set other things in promise, not, not out of wanting to, but because if Satan can't get us to just not be zealous, then he wants you to get too busy. And then you're too busy for Jesus. <laughs> I'm reading a book right now, and uh, I'm working. It's a problem. I recognize it. You know, that I have to work to slow down. And if, if I'm honest, you probably do too. Amen. Um, <laughs> I asked my pastor one day, you got more hours a day than everybody else? <laughs> when I see some of the things they do. No, he don't. But we have to not allow other stuff to crowd in. Amen. Because we love the Lord, but in loving the Lord, we can get so busy, we don't have time for the Lord we love. And so he's telling them, look, this is what you need to work on. You've left your first love. You substitute being busy. Amen. For time with him. How can you get too busy to read the Bible? Got a lot of Christians too busy to read the scriptures. They even say they're too busy to listen. Now, in, in this book I'm describing, and, I, and I'm going to wait till I finish it, and then I'm going to recommend it, I'm pretty sure. You know, he's saying, well, you know, Ashley, we've said that you got time for anything that you prioritize. And so he said, you don't have time to read the Bible. How many hours do you sit in front of the TV? How many hours do you spend searching through your phone? See, it's so easy to get, so he's warning them about distraction, isn't it? One of the biggest enemies you and I can face is being distracted. Man, I, I got so much to do. I can't go to church today. Wait a minute, that's, not, that's just a tithe of your two hours? And anything I leave at home will still be waiting when I get back. Amen. But we can get so caught up in that business, can't we? So we can see us in the church. This is to that church. But when he says this letter is to be circulated throughout the churches, and that will come on down to us. And so he's warning them and us as well and uh, leaving our first love. So that means we need to examine ourselves from time to time and really take note of what's crowding in. Amen. And um, Work on it. Verse 5, he tells us what to do about it. He said, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent and do the first works. And where here's a church, they're, they're just, you know, if you had a, a list, you're checking out what you needed to do that the Apostle Paul said. They're doing all that, but they're so caught up in doing that, they don't have time for the one they're doing it for. See, that's the easy trap, I, you know. Guilty is charged. I, you know, been there, working on, you know, that can happen to all of us if we don't watch it. Huh? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And the Bible says I'm not alone too. Same afflictions in our brethren in the world. That's a challenge in this day, isn't it? It's so much to distract us, so much to pull our attention away, um, you know, that other generations didn't have. 
and uh, the pace of life is so quick, but we have to watch that we don't get drawn away from our primary love. So remember, this is what he tells to do about it, um, and it's not a, a criticism, it's an, an admonishment to self-correct, remember from thence thou art fallen, and turn or repent, and do the first works. And this is how we get back on track. You know, when we first got saved, man, you know, all I wanted to do was read the word. Yeah. You know, for the first uh, probably seven, eight, nine years, I, I was reading through the Bible once a year. And the addition, man, you know, but then distractions, business, and before you know it. Now, that doesn't mean you get under condemnation because you didn't do that. Because that's another trap the enemy will get you into. I'm not reading enough word. And you feel like if I don't read X number of chapters a day or a certain amount of books a month, then you come under condemnation. That's legalism. See, the enemy wants us in either ditch. And that's not really demonstrating a love for God. Amen. Even though I'm doing something that he tells me to do, I'm doing it then out of uh, maybe a, a ritual. Amen. Amen. Now, I think we need to be grace empowered. Amen. Set goals to read through the word of God, yeah. But if you happen to get caught up in, it, and the Holy Ghost says spend time here and you didn't hit your quota that you set for the day, don't come out of the condemnation. Now, I don't know why I'm saying that. Somebody need to hear that. Amen. But don't beat yourself down. Amen. Allow him to feed you. Amen. He said repent and do the first works or else. See, that's a warning, isn't it? See, there are seven things that he goes through to each church. I will come unto thee quickly and remove that candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. And then he says, but this thing thou hast, another good thing, thou hatest the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Let's say that together. Nicolaitans. That's not chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Amen. It sort of sounds, it's not Neapolitan. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Jesus said he hated it. So there's something about this particular doctrine that Jesus despised. And it really goes back to what he was talking about when he said that thou hast tried them that say they are apostles and found them to be false. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans ties directly into that. And what the doctrine of uh, the Nicolaitans is, is when a group or a sect, and this was happening in this church, claim apostolic authority over other people in that church or in the body around them. In other words, when they set themselves up as an apostle, and no matter what they do, you're supposed to not hold them in account. Now, I know we've seen that. And one of the primary things that they'll do is build a uh, um, uh, uh, um, um, maybe a fear in believers to call them into account for what they do. And that's why I mentioned, you know, they'll say, touch not man anointed and do my prophets no harm. Because if you do that, then you can't hold them accountable for what they say, how they live, and what they, what they do with their life. Y'all see what Pastor's saying? Jesus said he hated that. So this is a breakdown on two words, um, nikaio, which means to conquer or rule, and laos, which means the laity or the general church body. Whenever someone sets themselves up, not to lead the sheep, but to dominate the sheep, and to teach the sheep that they have to submit to all that they say, look, only obey me as I obey Jesus. Amen. Don't follow me if I don't follow him. But we often see people go off into error because the leader taught them and they followed. And they overrode those little checks in the spirit. No, 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 because, yeah, but I'm supposed to be submitted. Yeah, we are, but we're submitted to the Lord Jesus first and to his word. And whenever a leader gets away from the word of God, I can reason and judge that they've gotten away from Jesus. I'm not to follow anyone to the error. And so when a leader sets themselves up 
to operate in a position of no accountability over the body of Christ. Amen. You're to judge that and say, no, that's not. Mm -mm. So he hated that because Jesus said we are to rule the church, but that word means to steer or to govern. Amen. Not require that people do things that the Bible um, uh, doesn't tell you to do. So it's to rule over the laity and to dominate them. And the Bible calls those false apostles. Uh, it would also be false shepherds that uh, would fall in that so often warned about in the Old Testament. And so he's warning about those things. And then he says again after that, verse 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear. That's the personal application. Some say that's the homiletic of it. How do I use what he's saying? How do I apply this to my life? Well, I need to be on guard. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. Pastor read that wrong. He didn't say the church. Church is plural. So the message is to this church, but it applies to the churches. So there's a past application and a present application. Other words, saints, we're not to let our guard down. Amen. We're not to follow leadership simply because someone has a title. You always got people looking for titles. You don't see in the word of God where the Lord passes out titles. Amen. Actually, the Bible says he that would be greatest among you should be what? Servant of all. Amen. And so that means if someone is seeking to be served, judge it. That'll keep a lot of people out of sin, won't it? Often people say they fell into sin because the person in leadership over them took authority, um, took advantage of that leadership position to coerce them to do what they wouldn't normally do, even physically. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That's why Jesus said, that doctrine I hate. So he that had an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, cap, big capital S, said to the churches. And then there's a promise when you overcome. Now there are promises to overcomers given to every church, all these seven churches as well. To him that overcometh here will I give to eat of the tree of life. Well, you're already saved. Yeah, but there, this is part of your inheritance as well. I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You know, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out that, you know, a lot of what we enter into is based on what we've done here. We're called to do good works as believers. We've inherited a kingdom, but there are rewards in, the eter in eternity for you and I based on how we carried ourselves and our serving God. That's our rewards. Amen? And he says here, um, you can eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So we want that, don't we? So if we find ourselves getting drawn astray and getting caught up, we need to get back to the basis, the first works. What did I do when I first got saved that I stopped doing? Remember when praying and, and witnessing was a joy, and reading the word was a joy, and if we don't watch it, we can get so bogged down, man, I got to read my Bible. I need to read some. Amen. Talking from experience, too. Amen. So, um, but there are promises for us when we overcome in it. So that's a message. Now, we won't do this this week, but these seven churches also mirror the, the church from this first one, which is called the Apostolic Age, all the way through to our current day, where we generally say the, the Philadelphian age, uh, but more prominently probably Laodicean church. Paints a picture of the church throughout history as well, because people hadn't changed. But there are certain things historically that happened in sequence of these churches that we've seen. Verse 8, the message to Smyrna. Somebody says Smyrna. Amen. Anybody got an idea what Smyrna means or the root of Smyrna? Uh, 
God's mirth. Um, let's look at this. Now, the church name is Smyrna, isn't it? And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the title of Jesus here is the first and the last, which was a, a dead and is alive. Notice how he, is, he titles. Each time we're going to see a title, church, a title for the Lord, amen. And here he says he's the first and the last, amen. The Alpha and the Omega, we will say the beginning and the end, amen. All things, you know, we were made by him and for him, amen. You know, he's the creator of all that is, isn't he? So he, this is his title. But then he also says, which was dead and is alive. That reminds me of Revelation 1, 17 and 18, where he says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I have the keys of hell and death. Amen. So that title of Jesus speaks to his sacrifice, but his resurrection as well. He's literally saying, I'm the one that died for you, and I'm raised again for your justification. But he said, I know your works, for, uh, uh, verse 9. So no matter what the church is, even this, when he know whether we're sincere or not, amen, and in our churches, he knows if we are really just going through the motions or not. Because every church, he said, I know your works. <laughs> so he, Paul said in Hebrews, nothing is hidden from the one with whom we have to do. So we may as well be open and honest in our walk and our relationship with Jesus, shouldn't we? So he says, but notice here, this church in uh, what? Some would call walking necessarily in what they would call a blessing. This is a persecuted church. Now, this word Smyrna is from the Greek word that we get. We say myrrh. And um, myrrh literally is symbolic in the Bible of death. Now, myrrh was a bitter herb, wasn't it? And uh, it was very expensive. It was used in perfumes but also was used in embalming the dead so as to mute the smell of the decay. Now, in Matthew 2.11, if you remember in what we call the Christmas account, they brought Jesus three gifts. What were they? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They presented three gifts. What are those three gifts symbolized? Now, if you know my three kings, see, this is why there's a theology in certain Christmas songs. You, if you learn that as a child, you already know. See, that's why I say we need to read them and saints, we need to teach them. Amen. Um, second verse is myrrh is man, it's bitter perfume. Breeze alike, a life of sorrowing gloom, sorrowing sand, bleeding down, sealed in a stone cold tomb. Is that good theology in a song? Yeah, it is. Tells you what myrrh symbolized. You know, they embalmed him. They used myrrh. But to get the odor, whether it was for a perfume or for an embalmment out of it, it had to be crushed. Oh, Jesus was pierced and literally crushed for us, wasn't he? We're the beneficiaries of it. This church, then, even in its title, is known for producing myrrh, but this church also came under heavy persecution. And that sets the stage for this letter. He says, I know thy works and thy what? Tribulation and poverty. Amen. So they were impoverished. They were under great tribulation during this time. And if we were talking about where is this on the timeline of churches from then unto now, it would be after the apostolic age where there came in the third century the birth of what we would call the Catholic Church. Now, not getting into that right now, but right here, I know thy works in tribulation. I know your poverty. Amen. Now, before I go, amen, we mentioned myrrh is connected to the Lord's death, isn't it? Well, what was the gold symbolic of? Kingship. 
frankincense, his priesthood. All that mentioned in that Christmas song, but it's biblical. Amen? And so the Lord knows this. He knows what's going on with this particular people. And um, he begins to commend them. They're enduring tribulation and poverty. And he says, but you're rich. Kind of opposite of some of the messages that go out in the body of Christ today. Amen. Where we equate all riches based on monetary wealth. God wants to prosper us, but there's more to prosperity than money. Amen. Here's a people that's in poverty, in tribulation, and he says, but they are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those which say they are Jews. Once again, there are some things going on in the church that should not be in the church, but are the synagogue of Satan. So he commends them for what they are enduring, but he also mentions here that there are people among them who say they are Jews, but are actually of Satan's synagogue. Um, are they Satan worshipers? Yeah, you, you might have some of that, but um, actually they're committed. He said blasphemy. He said, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews. So it's not necessarily just a worship of Satan, but them being opposed to the things of God. You know, the blaspheme of the Holy Spirit is to do what? To deny, to attribute the works of God to Satan. So you have a root of people in here that might be seeing the work of God, might be seeing God at work, and they're denying it. And he calls them the synagogue of Satan. And they might even be t teaching them that, you know, because you're suffering, you're not godly. Well, why do you say that, Pastor? The next verse says, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried. See, a lot of our American concepts of uh, serving God, we're beginning to see those erode. And a lot of people kind of look at what they see happening with Jews, the anti-Semitism. Look, after the anti-Semitism against the Jews, the next object is the Christian. Amen? But he says here concerning this that the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Don't fear what you're going to suffer. So he's what right into a persecuted church. Amen. Remember after A.D. 70, um, under Titus, amen, after the Jerusalem was ransacked and the Jews were dispersed, during Domitian there were a series of persecutions that came upon the early church. It said in Fox's Book of Martyrs that so many Christians would be in put to death, and hung on crosses that they lit the way they would have them land up going into Jerusalem. Heavily persecuted. It was during this time that the church went underground in the, in the, under the, in the catacombs of Rome because you couldn't meet publicly. And the church was forced to worship. And that's where you get that uh, Christian symbol, the, the fish, amen, with the menorah on it. That was one of the ways that they would identify who they were and the point to way the way they worshiped. But they were underground due to the persecution. Jesus said, don't fear those. The devil would cast some of you into prison. Some were in prison for the faith. Paul was in prison for the faith, wasn't he? Peter got in prison for the faith, didn't he? Amen? And here they find themselves being, being um, under the same judgments. And he says that some of you shall be cast into prison, that ye may be tried, tested, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. There were ten major persecutions during this age that the church endured. It's amazing that Jesus spoke that before it even came to pass. He warned them. Amen. And then he encourages them what to do. 
And this is what we're to do when we're going through those, those times that we may experience before Jesus comes, you know, and we may not be far away from actually getting persecuted as believers. They're already cutting off ministries' bank accounts. Yeah, because the banks don't agree with what they stand for. They're already trying to cancel you. Amen? And they're already seeking as much as they can to demean us. See, what they do, and most Christians haven't caught on to it yet, when they start talking about the right wing, they're basically talking about believers. See, we had, because if you're pro-life, pro-family, <laughs> amen, yeah, they hate you. There's this obsession with death in our culture. And once they dehumanize who you are, it sets the stage for persecution. And so we're not far away from some of these things. He said here, you shall to this church have tribulation 10 days. And then there's the encouragement to them, be thou faithful unto death. And I'll give you the crown of life. And he says, he that hath an ear, let him hear. See, once again, he says the same thing each time, doesn't he? You got an ear, amen. Don't be afraid, be faithful unto death. What is it about death that should take the fear of it from you and I as a believer? Because most of what keeps us in bondage is the fear of dying. Huh. See, we need a revelation. Huh? Amen. Yeah, when we got saved, we received the gift of eternal life, didn't we? We need to match and experience what the Bible says. We need to get our belief in line with the Scriptures. What does the Bible say happen to you and I when we die? Matter of fact, Jesus said, fear not those that can kill the body, but fear the one who can cast both body and soul into hell. Amen. And so here, I, here we are. We're born-again believers. And one of the biggest hindrances to us standing for our faith, for telling other people about Jesus, is the fear of the body. Isn't it? What they're going to say, what they might do to you and I, if we take a bold stand for Jesus. What does the Bible say? Because Jesus said, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. We call that the martyr's crown for those who serve, even if it costs them their lives. Y'all remember that song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus? Amen. That's what the man pinned on his last writing before they killed him. He was serving God as a missionary. And in the country that he was in, they had him, his wife, and his child. And first they took the child said, deny Jesus. And we'll let this child live. He wouldn't deny him. They killed this child. Then they came and got his wife. Denied Jesus. And we'll let her live. He was already in prison. And he wouldn't deny Jesus. And to say that she looked over at him, she knew he shouldn't deny Jesus. And he didn't. And she died. And lastly, they asked him. And he said, no, and they killed him. Later, they went into a cell, and they found he had pinned, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee the crown of life. What you and I need to understand about death, then, is that when he died, all that died was his body. He inhabited the body. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. See, that revelation, Jesus said in John 11, 25 and 26, I am, he that, I am the resurrection and the life. He that liveth and believeth in me shall And then he said, believest thou this? So if we settle the issue that when this body ceases to function, I go to be with Jesus. My shell is planted in the ground. 
when Jesus returns, this body planted is going to be raised up and meet my soul and spirit once again in the air, and I'll be with Jesus forever. See, this is why they didn't fear death. They believed in the resurrection. Well, we believe in the resurrection, but the, the, we hadn't settled the issue, man, I, I, can I stand? You know, so we need to make that determination, though. So when this body ceases, I'm not here. I'm with Jesus. I'm not sleep, as some say. You either when you leave here. Soul sleep is not a Bible doctrine. Amen. There are only two places we go when our body leaves, the, our spirit leaves the body. is either down or up. Hell or heaven. Amen. And so as for you and I as a believer, when this body is rendered ineffective due to age, Amen. Or ailment or whatever may happen to it, I go to be with him. So they knew life didn't cease. There's a continuation of life in a different place where Jesus is. Amen. So be thou faithful unto death. See, it applies to us then. And I'll give you a crown of life. Notice what else Jesus says in the 11th verse here. If you have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said. So we need to settle the issue. We don't need to fear of death as believers. I'm not rushing to die. I love being alive on earth. But I know that when I do that, I'm with Jesus. Amen. Amen. To leave here he is there. That's how quick it is. Absent in the body, Paul said, present. Amen. And... Um, so we need to take heed to this, don't we? He that overcome it, that's the promise, shall not be hurt of the second death. What's the second death? When he's talking to a persecuted people? What's the second death? Amen. Cast into hell. Ashley, yeah. And see, you and I, who are in the first resurrection, we're going to see in this book, we're to have no fear of the second death. Amen. Daniel talks about it in Daniel chapter 12, too. Amen. Some will rise to everlasting life, others to everlasting damnation. Amen. The second death is not to be feared by you and I. Well, what about judgment, Pastor? Well, we all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, but that's not a judgment unto condemnation. We're already saved. That's a judgment for reward or the loss thereof. But Paul said you'll be saved, so is by fire. Your works, your motives will be judged, but you're already in eternity with Jesus. You don't lose that. Amen. That's why I've said, and I still had not done it, we're going to do a, a series of teachings on inheritance and reward. We inherited a kingdom. We'll be rewarded for how we serve God in his kingdom. Amen. And there are crowns that are reserved for you and I based on our service. And there are positions in eternity given based on our service. Jesus talks about some of it we're going to see as we go through these churches. But being an overcomer, amen, this is the victory to overcome in the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcome in the world but he that believe it that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, from that standpoint, you're already an overcomer spiritually. Now, this is the outworking of it, even in life, when we are being ostracized, slandered, put down, ridiculed, uh, even assaulted for our testimony in Jesus. And he's warning you and I, we need to stay faithful. Amen. And we won't be hurt of the second death. That's an encouragement to me. Amen. Amen. So you and I, as he's telling this church, don't fear persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12, someone turn there and read it for us, please. Amen. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Because one of the things we fear more than anything else is to be called out and ostracized for our faith in Jesus. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Read it again. Yea, and all that... Do that yea forceful. Yea! <laughs> <laughs> yea, 
and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Amen. Why? Because the world is against you. You're in this world. You're not of the world. They don't understand where you're coming. They definitely don't, can't wrap their minds around where you're going. You're talking about you serving an invisible king in an invisible kingdom. And they go, no, nah, you're crazy. Well, I know how I got here. No, you, you evolved. No, I didn't evolve. I was created. You know, and, you know, those two worldviews clash. You get persecuted for what you believe. Amen. And so all that live godly, we're not to be exempt. We've been blessed in this country beyond measure. Because most of the world has not experienced what we've had in America that we take for granted. Freedom to serve God without being oppressed. Amen. But generally, all that live godly will suffer persecution. Because just your presence irritates those that don't know Jesus. Amen. And so these are things that he's speaking to you and I. Amen. The last one we'll look at tonight is the church of Pergamos. Say Pergamos. Well, this was a rough place here. To be in Pergamon was to be at the very forefront of spiritual warfare. Notice, let's read these verses together through 17 and then we'll unpack them. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things said he which had the sharp sword with two edges. I know, I know thy works, where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Let's stop right there. Amen. So there's something different about this city. Amen. Now the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities are spirits that have a certain rule over a, a geographic area. Amen. Uh, we see that in Daniel chapter 10. Amen. When Daniel was praying and the, and, and the angel came and said, Lo, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood him 21 days. And then Michael came and the angel came and brought Daniel to revelation for the last days. And then he said, But lo, when I go, the, king, the prince of Grecia cometh. Well, that was the kingdom that came after the Persian kingdom, but there was a spirit behind the king. Uh, we see that in Ezekiel as well concerning the king of Tyre. There was a lamentation to the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre, and in that instance, it was the devil himself, Ezekiel 28. And so behind governments, there, there, there are ruling spirits that seek to direct them. That's one of the reasons why I would pray for those in authority. They're in a warfare spiritually that they don't even understand if they don't know Jesus. This is why people go to D.C., a lot of them well-intentioned. And after they get there, they get turned out and corrupt. You ever notice that? Amen. It's because of the spirit over the area. Amen. The deception that they're surrounded by, the compromise that they're bombarded with daily. If you don't have your spiritual... Um, um, uh, shoes on, if you're not standing in the armor of God, you can easily get swept away. Amen. Because of the principalities that they wrestle with. Notice this church in Pergamos. He said it right. Jesus gives us to Pergamos. Jesus identifies himself as being the one with the sharp sword with two edges. That reminds you of Hebrews 4.12, doesn't it? Amen. Whereas we're, you know, sharp two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and intents. Amen. It's the Lord Jesus being referred to here as the one that at the power of his word discerns our thoughts, our intents. He creates, he can put down by what he says. And to this church, he says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest. How often have we felt like man kind of isolated from God? No, he knows where we are. Even this church, he said, I know where you dwell. And you are dwelling where Satan's seat is. And yet, he commends them, thou hast holdest fast my name. They're literally at what was thought to be the headquarters. He called it Satan's seat. Pergamum was the seat of idol worship concerning Zeus, 
this is where mythology really comes into play, whom they called the father of the gods. This is where they are. And so they're in a place where you're going to find different aspects of worship. I'm going to read you all some things concerning this city. It was a very wealthy city. It was known as Satan's seat because of the altar of Zeus there. And they thought that Zeus was born at Pergamum. And because of that, they built an altar where they thought Zeus was born at the top of a plateau that raised above the plain some thousand feet. And the altar at the top of it alone, it was some 50 feet high, 125 by 115. That's just the, the base of it. And then it, it stood up and it spread out. Actually, um, um, it, that, that Zeus's throne was actually taken apart, still exists to this day. And it was taken, it's in Germany now. Hitler took it there. No wonder why he was such an oppressive guy. This altar, it had a golden street leading to it that had shrines to Apollo, another Greek god. Not only Apollo, but Aphrodite that was a goddess of love and beauty, a sex cult religion. So it's not like in Ephesus you had Diana here, you've got a whole conglomeration of these gods, including Zeus, Aphrodite, Apollo, um, another one called Esselaus, which is a god of medicine, and the god of medicine symbol, symbol in, in Greek um, mythology is the symbol that you see, the serpent in twin. That's not, what, that's not representing Jesus on a pole. That was a symbol for the god of medicine. They worship him. There's another one, a nature goddess called Sibylle, Poseidon, the sea god, all them submarina movie watchers. That's who he's based on. A corn god named Demeter, and they believe that Sibylle was the mother of Zeus, so it's the mother cult religion that goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel and Semiramis and Tammuz. So this place was drenched in pagan worship. And um, they also believed that she was the mother of Hades. No wonder why he called this where Satan's seat is. And in that place, there's planted this church. And even though they're being persecuted and harassed, he says, look, I know where you dwell. Even where Satan's seat is. Amen. Amen. So just being in that environment, they had to withstand against those principalities daily. But he said, you're holding fast my name. And even when my faithful martyr Antipas was slain among you where Satan dwelt, there was a harsh place to live for a believer. And so he's commended them on that, what they've done. But nevertheless, verse 14, I have a few things against thee. Because even in the midst of that, they've allowed some things to creep in. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. And if in the Old Testament, we remember Balak and Balaam, don't we? We remember that Balaam was um, the, well, you know, he, he was the one that Balak went to and wanted them to speak curses on Israel. And he was the one that said, I can't curse what God had blessed. And each time he offered a pain, God knew his heart. He said, go, and he would get up there, and he would still bless the nation of Israel. But somewhere between Numbers 25 and 31, this thing arose that they're looking back on, and they call it the doctrine of Balaam. And what Balaam did, he let them know, look, God is with them. I can't curse them. But if you'll get them to offend in the area of their God, then God, they would lose their protection. And the doctrine of Balaam, is the thing he says, you're holding to these, you are tolerating those that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now, what did they do? He taught them to eat. He allowed them. Look, tell them, look, I know the Bible says there are certain foods that are kosher. You, you can eat, you know, it's got a, 
the hoof got to be this way. If not, you can't eat it. That means you can eat lamb, but you can't eat pig. And he taught them to eat things that were sacrificed to idols and fornication. The doctrine of Balaam, if we, if we were to say, well, what's that doctrine? It's the doctrine of tolerance. God knows your heart. So you can indulge yourself in things that the Bible forbids. And that's in the church. Isn't it? Yeah. Amen. And whenever we begin to walk willfully in disobedience, we come out from underneath the, the umbrella of God's protection. He taught them to do that. And so they intermarried. You know, some people call, you know, uh, with the nations that were around them. And he taught the nation to sin and they lost the blessing of God. That's one thing. Amen. You know, so we shouldn't be surprised in that area that these doctrines would be uh, surrounding them. Wow. Pergamon also, amen, he said, uh, the, verse 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. So there's a priestly sect that they can't uh, really say anything against in that church to exercise control over a lot of the people. The Lord hates that, doesn't he? Whenever there's a man in the middle between us and God, that's not of God. Amen? We don't have to confess sins to a person. We go directly to our high priest, Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, if I wrong you, I can come to you. I'm not saying that. But you, don't, you can't forgive me. God can. You can forgive me of what I did, I'm sorry, as an offense to you. But I also need to repent before God. Amen? So he says he hate these two major doctrines that they were involved in. This place, Pergamum, is where emperor worship originated as well. And uh, they worship another god called Diaromus, who was a feminine god, the goddess of Rome. See, the Romans believed that there were two um, um, Romulus and Ramus that were the progenitors of Rome. Man, I, they were raised by a lion or something. I, I forget exactly. But they believed that. But they believed this goddess, amen, was, was involved. They called her the goddess of Rome. This place is where they first introduced emperor worship uh, into the world at that particular point that was against the church of God. And once a year, Rome didn't care what gods you worshipped. Every nation, notice when you read through the New Testament, especially the Gospels, the Jews are free to practice Judaism. But as long as they don't cause a big stir, or a riot or something, and, you know, Rome left them alone. One of the things that they were afraid of as it led up to the crucifixion of Jesus was that they would be held into account. We see that in Acts as well. Well, emperor worship comes up, and we got to move quickly now. And once a year, even though you worship whomever you wanted, you'd be required to take a pinch of salt and offer in the name of Caesar and burn it. And if you didn't do it, you were on the penalty of death. At the same time, you had to declare that Caesar is Lord. And the church wouldn't do that, and it led to great persecution. Paul in Philippians 2, that declaration that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord was a death sentence in Pergamum the seat of emperor worship. And so this church is being tried. People are being slain and martyred for their faith in Jesus because they wouldn't go with it. And so Jesus tells them, look, don't allow these doctrines to get in among you. You hold fast to what you have. And then he tells them, repent or I will come quickly and we'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth, those who hold those doctrines. The Lord really hates things that harm and and violate his people. And then his last warning in closing, to him that hear it, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. To him that overcome it will I give him to eat of a hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receives it. What in the world is he talking about? Amen. 
Well, if you hear what the Spirit is saying, he said to him that overcome it. That's my KO again, that doesn't let themselves get absorbed and drawn into you staying in victory over that. I'll give you to eat of the hidden manna. What's manna? Well, we know in the Old Testament, what is it? But he said the hidden manna, spiritual nourishment that we get from him. It's hidden. It's not necessarily visible. Amen. But he nourishes us and he strengthens us and he feeds us. We're strengthened with might by his spirit as we abide in him, aren't we? And then he said, and then not only that, I'll give him a white stone. <laughs> and at first I was going, what in the world does this mean? And a new name written, a white stone. And then looking into that, I found that Oftentimes in the judicial system, there would be, the, the judge would have two, a black and a white stone. And it could be at a time before that bar where either you were acquitted or you were condemned. Well, if you were condemned, you got the black pebble or stone. He said to him to overcome it, I'll give him a white stone. So unless we know what they're talking about, we'd be going, man, what in the world is this about? To those that stand fast, he said, you're justified, and I'll give you a white stone and a new name written, which no man know it, save in he that receive it. That's personal, isn't it? Amen. Maybe the Lord has a, a personal name for us based on how we serve. Who knows? Amen. But um, um, we see that there are rewards in our serving, isn't it? And as I believe our exhortation in each one of these, is that we're to stand fast. The pressure may be on you from time to time. Don't, don't quit. Don't tolerate what the Lord doesn't tolerate. Now, I know we're in a tolerant culture, but we don't only tolerate what Jesus tolerates. And if that means that the world sees you and I as being intolerant and wanting to re redefine what love is because they think love means putting up with any and everything, we need to stand with, against that. It'll cause you and I to stand out like a sore thumb can make us a target, but we're to be faithful, aren't we? So he's really encouraging you and I, church today, we need to be faithful. We need to avoid the sin of toleration. Amen? Just putting up with any and every old thing that the world pushes our way. Amen? We need to be on guard against adversaries of the church that arise within the church. Amen? And we need to make sure that we check ourselves that we keep doing the first works in Jesus' name. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to bless us tonight. Give us understanding, Lord, as we continue to read throughout the rest of this chapter and chapter 3 as well. Speak to our hearts distinctly, Lord, that we might be that people, Lord, that the overcomers that you mentioned at the end of each uh, church's admonition, Lord, that we'll be that overcoming believer, being faithful, Lord, standing, holding fast, determined, Lord, to hear you say, well done, in Jesus' name.